Part 3, Chapter 4 Léon soon put on an air of superiority before his comrades, avoided their company, and completely neglected his work. He waited for her letters, he re-read them, he wrote to her. He caught it to mind with all the strength of his desires and of his memories. Instead of lessening with absence, this longing to see her again grew, so that at last on Saturday morning he escaped from his office. When, from the summit of the hill, he saw in the valley below the church spire with its tin flag swinging in the wind, he felt that delight mingled with triumphant vanity and egoistic tenderness that millionaires must experience when they come back to their native village. He went rambling round her house. A light was burning in the kitchen. He watched for her shadow behind the curtains, but nothing appeared. Mère Lefrancois, when she saw him, uttered many exclamations. She thought he had grown and was thinner, while Artemise, on the contrary, thought him stouter and darker. He dined in the little room as of yore, but alone, without the tax-gatherer, for Binet, tired of waiting for the hirondelle, had definitely put forward his meal one hour, and now he dined punctually at five, and yet he declared usually the rickety old concern was late. Léon, however, made up his mind and knocked at the doctor's door. Madame was in her room and did not come down for a quarter of an hour. The doctor seemed delighted to see him, but he never stirred out that evening, nor all the next day. He saw her alone in the evening, very late, behind the garden in the lane. In the lane, as she had the other one. It was a stormy night, and they talked under an umbrella by lightning flashes. Their separation was becoming intolerable. I would rather die, said Emma. She was writhing in his arms, weeping. Adieu, adieu, when shall I see you again? They came back again to embrace once more, and it was then that she promised him to find soon, by no matter what means, a regular opportunity for seeing one another in freedom at least once a week. Emma never doubted she should be able to do this. Besides, she was full of hope. Some money was coming to her. On the strength of it, she bought a pair of yellow curtains with large stripes for her room, whose cheapness Monsieur Leroux had commended. She dreamt of getting a carpet, and Leroux, declaring that it wasn't drinking the sea, politely undertook to supply her with one. She could no longer do without his services. Twenty times a day she sent for him, and he at once put by his business without a murmur. People could not understand either why Mère Rollet breakfasted with her every day and even paid her private visits. It was about this time, that is to say the beginning of winter, that she seemed seized with great musical fervour. One evening when Charles was listening to her, she began the same piece four times over, each time with much vexation, while he, not noticing any difference, cried, Bravo! Very good! You are wrong to stop! Go on! Oh, no, it is execrable. My fingers are quite rusty. The next day he begged her to play him something again. Very well, to please you. And Charles confessed she had gone off a little. She played wrong notes and blundered, then stopping short. Ah, oh, it is no use. I ought to take some lessons, but... She bit her lips and added, Twenty francs a lesson, that is too dear. Yes, so it is, rather, said Charles, giggling stupidly. But it seems to me that one might be able to do it for less, for there are artists of no reputation and who are often better than the celebrities. Find them, said Emma. The next day when he came home he looked at her shyly and at last could no longer keep back the words. How obstinate you are sometimes. I went to Barfouché today. Well, Madame Ligard assured me that her three young ladies, who are at La Miséricorde, have lessons at fifty sous apiece, and that from an excellent mistress. She shrugged her shoulders and did not open her piano again. But when she passed by it, if Bovary were there, she sighed, Ah, my poor piano! And when anyone came to see her, she did not fail to inform them that she had given up music and could not begin again now for important reasons. Then people commiserated her. What a pity! She had so much talent. They even spoke to Bovary about it. They put him to shame, and especially the chemist. 
You are wrong. One should never let any of the faculties of nature lie fallow. Besides, just think, my good friend, that by inducing Madame to study, you are economising on the subsequent musical education of your child. For my own part, I think that mothers ought themselves to instruct their children. That is an idea of Rousseau's, still rather new, perhaps, but that will end by triumphing, I am certain of it, like mothers nursing their own children and vaccination. So Charles returned once more to this question of the piano. Emma replied bitterly that it would be better to sell it, this poor piano that had given her vanity so much satisfaction, to see it go was to Bovary like the indefinable suicide of a part of herself. If you liked, he said, a lesson from time to time, that wouldn't, after all, be very ruinous. But lessons, she replied, are only of use when followed up. And thus it was she set about obtaining her husband's permission to go to town once a week to see her lover. At the end of a month, she was even considered to have made considerable progress. End of part three, chapter four.